Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Tommy Kulik. I'm the creator and writer of Oswald and the Star Chaser. You can find it on scoutcomics.com or at your local comic store. Find me on Twitter at ETK Comics. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hey, I'm Tyler Von Amaran. I'm co-creator, co-writer, and letter of Oswald and the Star Chaser. You can also find us on thestarlands.com, kind of follow all our projects. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this interview with two very talented co-creators of an amazing comic, Oswald and the Star Chaser, which is a great name, by the way. We're joined today by Tommy Kulik and Tyler Villano Maron. How are you both doing today? Uh, we're great. Thanks for having us on. Doing good. For those that don't know anything about yourselves as creative people, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm Tommy Kulik. I'm the writer for Oswald and the Star Chaser. Been writing off and on different little projects. I wrote a little webcomic set in the same universe maybe a year or two ago. So I've always really liked the medium and this is just me trying to get into it. I've got a lot of stories I want to tell. Got like a goofy style. I think that shows in Oswald and the Star Chaser. It's more of a space fantasy adventure comic. A lot of, a lot of silliness, a lot of fun. Yeah, so I'm Tyler Villano Marin. I'm a career graphic designer, kind of turned comic book writer and letterer. I collaborate very closely with Tommy Kulik, my best friend. He really comes big from the whole comic book world. For like 10 years, I was like really into like the indie scene and music. So put together, Star Chaser is a really awesome collaboration from kind of both our spheres of cultural influence. What is the most misunderstood aspect about the sci-fi genre? Uh, that's a tough one. If you ask a lot of different people what sci-fi is, they'll give you different answers. I think for me, I think modern sci-fi, a lot of people are taking it as in more like Star Wars, which I don't think is a hard sci-fi. Not to say anything wrong with Star Wars. I love Star Wars. It's probably one of my favorite things around. But I feel like people have kind of gotten away from what sci-fi is. I wouldn't call all of the Star Chaser sci-fi. That's why I always kind of say space fantasy. In regards to the comic itself here, from what I've seen, it's beautifully drawn. You have great character interactions. I love the style of the different aliens. You know, I think the epitome of great space fantasy and space operas are the aliens because humans are a dime a dozen. But if you can draw and have really cool interacting with aliens in your worlds, I think that's the epitome of an amazing space fantasy. So talk about some of the, the cultures when you were working on creating the, the world of Oswald and the Star Chaser. So we've got a really talented artist, uh, Tom Hoskinson, and a lot of the aliens that you see in issue one, a lot of those were freestyled by him. And then a lot of them, you'll be like, oh, I came up with this goofy little dude. And then sometimes he would be like, here's what I think. He would be like, here's some cool guys I, I wrote. And it's like, oh, yeah, we can we can work back from that. That's pretty neat. And then in some of the later issues, I'll just throw in like a little description of what the alien will look like, something really vague. And then he always knocks it out of the park. So he's got a very creative mind. So a lot of it, it's not like, oh, we have a bunch of different specific species of aliens mapped out. A lot of it's just like, oh, draw someone who's got like a... A, a walnut face or someone who looks kind of like an angry dog and then this is what we go come up with. Yeah, that, that's like two sides of it, you know. But when we want to get really specific, Tom Hoskinson, the artist, can also kind of knock that out of the park. In issue, you know, two and three, when Oswald and the Star Chaser, they get to kind of their next destination, which is this rotating mechanical metropolis called Axis 3F. And there's an integral character called Deville Laviche. And this is more of a humanoid one. You know, she plays an integral role in kind of getting them through Axis, which is a very seedy planet. And I believe in the script, I'm like, you know, she's a very strong drawer, kind of like Grace Jones, the singer. And, you know, he gave us a few options and it was just perfect. Excited for people to see it. 
When building world, like you just mentioned, planet names, you know, you're, you're trying to flesh out a small section what's in your mind from a collaborative effort and co-creators and co-writers that you both are here. Who came up with some of the funnier names that you couldn't use in the book or who came up with some really weird planets that maybe we haven't seen yet, but we'll see on like a star chart or something. So there's a, a few names that did not make it in. I know, I know the two names that have not made it in. The, the big crab guy that you can see in the, the bottom right, his name's uh, Scuttler Crabano. And we just couldn't fit the name in the script. That's still his name. It's just, there's no point where it's like, oh, that's Scuttler Crabano. So <laughs> probably my favorite name. There is a character later on, who's a very, very big guy. In the script, I wrote his name as, it was basically Brick Shithouse, but with like apostrophe over the eye. So it's kind of like a, you know, fantasy-ish. Yeah. And then I think uh, Tom, the artist is like, can we put this in a, a book that's for all audiences? And I was like, I guess not. <laughs> so his name turned into like Brick Shows or something. Yeah. <laughs> I think creating names for both characters and planets, like that's my favorite part. I did a lot of that. One of my favorite ones to tell is a character who appears later in the series, but it, in issue two is um, mentioned by name. Called um, He's like this peace fanatic robot called um, Saint Orson came about was, you know, I was doing my Tommy and I, you know, we're like this really close. We just message on discord this, uh, and over a star chaser. It was like daily thinking of ideas and stuff. And we were planning a meeting and I was like, and then he had to, Tommy's like, does a Saturday or Sunday work for you? He did, he said, does, you know, sat or sun work for you? And he, he, he forgot to add spaces and it was like, does sat or sun? I'm like, that looks like a character name. Tell me about him. <laughs> and he's like, what? I'm like, who is sat or sun? And then, you know, sometimes I'll just kind of, you know, we'll like prompt each other and that will become like a character name. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> yeah. A lot of our character names came from me sending a typo and then Tyler <laughs> saying, oh, who's this character? Let's just capitalize, <laughs> capitalize on it. You know, I love improv, you know, just improving names. Not everything has to have a ton of thought and lore behind it. And I think it's a healthy mix if you have some of both which we do. I'm always curious about this. When you're designing your characters, how in-depth do you get into, besides the main characters, how in-depth do you get into like the character sheet of say your side characters or your supporting characters to really flesh out the, these stories that you're creating? Yeah, it depends on the character. I know for the side characters, sometimes I'll just throw in like quick blurb about them or like a little short little thing about their history and then just let Tom have at it. I know for the characters who are like the antagonists or the central role, Tom is pretty good about giving us like a huge sheet of different ideas he has on what they look like. And that's always really helpful. And then for characters like Oswald and Star Chaser, we spent a lot of time like iterating on that much more in depth. I always find collaboration with multiple people, whether you're both writers or both artists, or you have a writer and artist team together, working together and to really realize a vision of what you're creating here. Tommy, what does Tyler bring from a creative perspective that balances you out? And Tyler, what does Tommy bring in your collaboration that balances you out? Uh, so I know I get really in the weeds a lot on, there's been a lot of stories that I've written for other than Star Chaser that have ultimately not made it because I get way hung up on like on one specific thing and it gets really convoluted and Tyler's really good at cutting that down and be like, hey, this is kind of ridiculous or this is a little silly. We're on the same wavelength a lot of times. So when I'm stuck on something, I can be like, hey, I'm kind of stuck on here and then he'll throw some ideas at me. Like, oh, those are really good ideas. Why didn't I think of this? So it helps that we're on the same wavelength, but then he's operating at like a different track. So when I'm getting too hung up on something or too far down a dead end, he can be like, hey, we got to figure out what we're doing, rearrange. And then the actual collaboration process, he does the co-writing. And so I'll summarize it. I'll do a rough outline and then he'll come out, go over it and see what works, what does it, what doesn't. And then I'll take that, turn to a script and then he'll do a secondary pass through. And then only at the end step, when he's lettering, he'll do a lot of the dialogue. He'll touch it up or fix it up or, so it's a lot of iteration that he helps bring and that helps like tune everything up. So it comes out as perfectly as it can. <laughs> I was actually going to say that Tommy's the one who grounds me. <laughs> and then he just said that I ground him. So the way we're writing this specific comic book, I think it's a comic book. <laughs> yeah. So the way that we write, that we're co-writing this specific com comic book is that Tommy is like the, the lead writing scripting role. And I'm very much co-writing even for the very beats. It's all, it's a, you know, like this, it's always a collaboration, but they really always come from him first. And I appreciate that. Like, I'll come in with ideas and like concepts, but he's always got like the foundation mm. pretty much. Challenges are always 
interesting when it comes to the, the collaborative process as well too. So then what challenges did you both overcome where you're really stuck in your respective corners trying to, to solve an issue? Uh, the space train. Later, later <laughs> in the comic, we got a space train. <laughs> Every so often, Teller would be like, I don't, I don't get the space train. What's what the space train is? I don't want a space train. So we, every now and then we argue about this story beat that'll happen later in the comic when they go on the space train. <laughs> Listen, I, I thought that the space train should take Oswald and Star Chaser from one, like, like one planet to another, but it actually just goes around a planet. Now, now I'm getting into spoilers. <laughs> 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 the space train isn't even relevant to no no no, no. you i've already given on the space train i'm i'm okay i'm, I'm okay with i like the space train i, I didn't used to but I've, I've warmed up to the space train we really don't butt heads at all we're both big shit posters you know we, we, we just vibe <laughs> yeah we don't we don't usually have conflicts like that generally if, if one of us has an idea and the other disagrees it's generally like okay i can see the problem with it now it's never like i want this <laughs> no, you shouldn't. And then we just fight it. And then a lot of times if he suggests something, I disagree with it, or I suggest something, he disagrees with it. We usually find a pretty good middle ground. We can work it out. But that's good. I mean, the fact that you're you're both best friends, you already know each other's like foils that make you both work well together. I don't think you would put together a series if you didn't obviously like working together. So that works out well for you both. Yeah, we both know how to pitch and write for each other. <laughs> like, well, we know what each other likes. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I've always been a big reading guy. I always loved to read. You know, in elementary school, I was always reading something. Just throughout school, I was always reading something. I think a lot of how I write is kind of reflected in some of the books that I really enjoy reading and some of the comics I really enjoy reading. I always kind of like the more not absurd but more goofy kind of stuff so i think i always wanted to tell a kind of story where maybe you don't crack out loud but you smile a lot so i think that's always just been kind of me just reading books that make you feel something my answer will be more grammatical in that from the script to kind of the, the end um lettering stage you know it, it can look great on the script but once it gets you know onto my adobe illustrator and i'm like touching up the fine dialogue over the you know six issues of the first volume, I found that you can say a lot more with less words and that, you know, you can have all this, you know, da, 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 all through the page, you know, all these words, but sometimes like, like a really well thought out sentence or two can say more than like a paragraph or an, an info dump, you know, out of the character's mouth. Everyone usually asks, what's the most wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you both have received that has stuck with you in your career? I think the second wisest is what I got from our editor, Colleen Douglas. I'll give her a shout out. She's been really helpful. She's given a lot of good tips and I would try to pick the one I like the most from her, but probably keeping speech bubbles to 20 words. It sounds like not a big thing, but like when you're writing a script, it helps the dialogue because you'll look at what you've written and it's like, oh, this is... So not clicking here, and then you count it up as, oh, this is like 50 words. And I, I, once you start thinking of more concise language, and I always try to make my dialogue snappy. That's what I really like, I pride myself on is all, everything everyone says in the comic, it feels, it, it's got like a good, a good flow to it, I think. And then it really helps just thinking, okay, 20 words maximum. That's good, actually. It'd be good for film scripts as well, too. If some people wouldn't do an info dump during a monologue. Yeah, and then I saw it, uh, someone commented about comics in general. I was like, you ever open up a comic book page and you just see a ton of speech bubbles all over? Like, even before you start reading, it's like, oh, this is exhausting. And you just feel tired. <laughs> I try to avoid that. If I wanted words to cover a page, I'd just pick up a novel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly what mine is. Um, it's something that um, the, the scout editorial director, Andrea Lorenzo Molinari, who has you know, been really great communicating with us, you know, what he told me was that launching your comic, well really any comic book series but especially our debut and he basically said that in the launch improves your whole volume and what andrea told me is that you know because i think i was really focused on the release date and you know getting the first week perfect and he said that it's a marathon you know not a sprint you know kind of you got to keep that hype up you know not focus too much on that day your comic comes out because ours actually was delayed 
<laughs> a couple times because of um, the scout printer in Florida and the hurricane which happened. So that's kind of helped me stay grounded. <laughs> you know, it kind of helped me keep my sanity and stay grounded. Don't focus on that that one day or the first week. Being consistent, inevitably you have to do some self promotion. I was going to ask about Scout Comics. I've had a lot of creators on the show from that particular publisher. What does Scout Comics? allowed you to do or focus on i should say from a creator perspective now that they're publishing this amazing series uh, so they really helped us uh, just kind of focus on making the comic when we were pitching it to publishers we only had one issue and then a rough outline of the rest and then once it was cleared it was like all right let's get to the races and then colleen was there to really help give input on so as i was writing it and that helped really shape things to make it more clear-cut and more perfect as we were going yeah i think it was great that scout was willing to take a chance on us for sure because for tommy and i this is our you know kind of published comic book world debut we haven't really self-published anything or been previously published on a publisher and it keeps saying published a lot they took a chance and you know we really appreciate that is there a comic that made you feel the way you hoped readers of your work will feel after reading it i've got a comic and a tv show so i say the comic probably invincible mm -hmm. you know, everyone heard about that from the show I was a big fan of that when it was coming out like 10 or 15 years ago i think that was what really got me into the indie scene and I know people are going to think, well, it's kind of a tonal disconnect, but there's a lot of like, you know, fun moments of Invincible when it's not, you know, just people punching holes in other people. Uh, between that, there's a lot of like, just, you know, goofy moments where it's just, you know, having fun with comic books. And then uh, a show is Venture Brothers. Oh, yeah. Huge fan of that show. A lot of my humor kind of comes from the Venture Brothers. Not necessarily all the 80s stuff, but just like the kind of absurd and everything just being a little weird and then just kind of playing that straight. What do you think of the special they just released? I didn't know there was one. I didn't know they were making the movie. I think they did like a holiday special first to kind of test the waters. To see oh, I'll have to, I'll have to, uh, I totally missed that. Uh, but I got, the, I got their art book. Nice. I was, uh, I've been working through that. It's really good. I'm getting ready to rewatch it for the hundredth time. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a comic book because I, I have a video game, but I don't, sure. have, I don't have a comic book. I have a comic book in there somewhere. Yeah, so Tommy mentioned a comic book and a TV series, an animated show. And I'll mention a, a video game, actually. One of my all-time favorites is um, Paper Mario, Nintendo 64. The ones that came after were good, too. Just, it, it has such a... What did you enjoy about the game that makes you, made you want to write a comic, roughly, for it? Tommy mentioned, you know, Venture Bros and Invincible. And I'm going to come in with a video game, which was Paper Mario on the Nintendo 64, you know, so, so we're going back like two decades <laughs> here. And it's one of my favorite games of all time. It not only has a very well executed story and plot, which is very seamless, but kind of humor is ingrained through the characters and what happens to them every single chapter. And the game offers a, very, a really well-rounded experience between the plot, story, characters, and humor that over the whole series of Star Chaser, I would love us to be able to deliver. Like it's a very high standard, a very high quality. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I mean, you thinking about this? I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I would uh, say I've got a lot of different inspirations, but I don't want to give you a mile long list. Uh, I would say Stephen Bruce is a, a fantasy writer. I found his series when I was a kid at some used bookstore. Probably way too young to read it. It was kind of a very unique series. And all his books are really unique. And I think a lot of how I view fantasy and how I'm treating that with, you know, space fantasy and also on the Star Chaser kind of comes from his uh, ability to just kind of do whatever he wants and make it work. Maybe him and then just, you know, he's been at it for so long and kind of in his own sphere. And I was like, yeah, the, I guess that would be him. Where it's like, you can kind of just do your own story and make it a little bit weird, make it your own thing and you'll find that success. I have two answers, one for me and one for the both of us. And I think Tommy knows who that's going to be. But <laughs> uh, my answer is actually a musician, a very accomplished indie musician by this point named uh, Sufjan Stevens. I mean, he's put out an eclectic stream of albums over a couple of decades. And what stands out about them is that his music is very th thematic, I think his most well-known album is um, called Illinois, um, put out in 2005 on um, the label Esmatic Kitty. And from album to album, he always keeps, you know, one, a very high standard of quality. 
and he puts you know, a lot of a lot of you know research into the production, the themes. That every album is very is a very full and complete experience. He's put you know so much thought into kind of every song, the themes, and he blends your know, humor, which again is really a constant kind of our creative process, but also like kind of human emotion and. I think, you know, every album hits, <laughs> you know, he hasn't put out things one would consider subpar. I think that that's inspired kind of me as well. For Tommy and I, I was expecting him to say Grant Morrison, because <laughs> I think that that, that is something that in the beginning, it was that first, the first big common ground. I think Tommy was introducing me to some Grant Morrison stuff and we just both adore, respect and <laughs> just, you know, follow his work and as a creator. Oh, what's your favorite Grant Morrison, Tommy? That is a tough one. I'd say it depends on my mood, but usually Pax Americana, I think, is the one I revisit the most. That was on uh, his, he did the Multiversity, right? Yes, I was uh, part of Multiversity. It was uh, his take on the Charlton characters that inspired Watchmen. Yeah, you had introduced me to that very early on. Cause we, we started, you know, really getting into comics and collaborating in 2015 or 16. And we had like met in 2014 over an MMO and I read that. I enjoyed it. But I think mine would be doom patrol. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you can see a lot of that surface in, um, in my writing and what I add to our process. From a professional standpoint, you have both created a, an amazing series so far, and I can't wait to see more of what you create in the future. Obviously this isn't your only co-creation i can't wait to see what you come up with next and please feel free both to come back on the show and we'll talk about that as well too so professional and the fact that scout comics has picked you up is also uh, an amazing accomplishment in itself so you're professionally successful in that regard do you consider yourselves personally successful i would say i guess I'm kind of waiting until it hits the shelves uh, we've got the comp issues from Scout, and I haven't opened those yet. Waiting until it's the shelf before I say, oh, I am a comic creator now. It's just like, that's the, that's the moment when it's like, oh, it's, it's finally happened. Open your comps. Oh my God, it is beautiful. Star Chaser number one is beautiful. You have to open the, <laughs> you know, open your goddamn comps, Tommy. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, read, I'll read through it when I, when I buy number one. Buy no, I got, I got accounts, but I want to go to the store and, and you know, <laughs> see it on the shelf and maybe I'll buy it. Huh. Are you gonna be both going to like go into your local comic book stores and like sign it, you know, and just like put it back on the shelf? Uh, the, the, the store, the store I play cards at, where I play Flesh and Blood on Fridays, they're selling a few and they say, oh yeah, you can sign them on Fridays when you come down to play cards. Oh uh, yeah, I believe we've, I mean, both of us, but yeah, I think we, I'm answering for Tommy. I'll answer for me. Tommy already answered. I would say I am. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a good, uh, yeah, it's, like you said, it's a very in introspective question. Yeah, I believe that I've, and you know, both of us, we've achieved the first milestone in a long trajectory of milestones for being, I guess, personally successful, I guess, as um, comic creators, because getting your comic on the shelf or on the digital shelf through a publisher is uh, not an easy task. But I think once you've kind of been in it for so long, like Star Chaser, we got signed onto Scout two years ago, so like it's I personally am taking it for granted, and it like doesn't doesn't seem like a big deal anymore. But it is a huge deal, you know, I think. We, we shouldn't downplay kind of Star Chaser coming out on the long term. You know, we have lots of series, you know, IPs that I mean, the two of us we call ourselves, you know, <laughs> TNT. These Tommy and Tyler, he he's got the the top billing that so we want to get out into the the comic sphere, as it were. You got to celebrate the small wins, you know, a lot of us don't take the time to, you know, we're focused on goals and that's good, but we never realize what we've actually accomplished until we literally accomplish it. And then we think back on being published, Scout Comics, they've taken a chance and you both are delivering a, an amazing comic. So congratulations. That's an amazing win. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? For me, I think it's, I try to just keep working. I know we pitched Oswald and Star Tracer to a few places before. Anytime we got rejection letter, it was, you know, try not to take it like, oh, this is the end of the world. I don't want to like, not give up or whatever. I don't know if it's like a, working on a story where it kind of gets into a dead end. I know some of the stuff we were working on before I would write, you know, something and then it would just be 
completely terrible. And then try to be like, hey, this makes no sense or this doesn't work at all. And if I'm stuck in a dead end or something doesn't work, I'll try and approach it from a different direction or, you know, work on something else, you know, work through it. What you got to at the end there was uh, mine. So I worked through it. I don't allow a lot to manifest themselves as failure. I think, you know, most of uh, what we experienced, like, like the rejections at first, like image didn't pick us up, but you know, I don't see it as a failure. I see it as a setback, this marathon that we're riding through and running. <laughs> don't get hung up on failure. Don't allow things to present themselves as failures because they're just bumps in the road, minor, minor setbacks. One of the guests I had on recently said something along the lines of, I don't fail. I just look at it from a different angle and move on. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired of the creative in their own way, whether it's a comic writer or a creative person in some way, shape or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Wow, they're looking at our stuff and being inspired. That's a, <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of, a, a lot of pressure <laughs> when you don't, you don't even think about that. I think the best way to kind of inspire someone would be like, find your own voice. You know, everyone's got their own way of doing things and their own way, own way of telling a story. You're just finding that voice and letting it show in your work. I mean, if you look at some of the videos people make now, it's all really creative, like the younger stuff from, you know, like that stuff. So you just find your voice and finding a way to, you know, show who you are i think that's like the easiest way to really inspire whoever comes after you i guess something that i put into my work that i hope the next generation artists and writers can influence the next one is writing with sincerity and not writing for your peers i think that those are two big things like people can get really hung up on trying to appease the current uh, zeitgeist and being too focused on like on like what their peers are doing i'm a big proponent of the new sincerity uh, literature movement that it kind of, kind of really started in the nineties, uh, with David Foster Wallace. I, I guess I'm kind of two generations of, of a writer kind of after him. Cause it, that was like a two decades and we're just getting into our careers, but being kind of unabashedly sincere in your work. Sorry. What's the new sincerity movement? Just so I have some clarification. Uh, oh, cause I don't, I, it sounds familiar, but I can't picture it. It was a literary movement that started in the nineties and kind of a group of writers answer to everything being very ironic, just a, a whole combination of ironic and sincere, sarcastic, like that, that was, everything was kind of becoming a deconstruction, I guess, to a point with the you know, creatives rate of being kind of insincere and kind of always having to have that like edge, like Star Chaser is very sincere to the point where someone might find it to be, you know, a little cheesy or something, but it's from the heart. That was really good. I, I really like that. So if your life was a comic book or TV series or film, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Yes, I would, it would be a, every, every comic idea I've got, it's, you know, two, two characters riffing on each other, you know, Oswald and Star Chaser, that duo, super powerful. So I would. It's kind of about my life would just be, you know, TNT. <laughs> it's about both of us making comments, I guess. And then soundtrack, uh, every episode, every issue, different one. Uh, it started out Neon Indian, because uh, that was kind of what we listened to a lot for the initial stuff of Star Chaser. But yeah, then whatever music that I'm into after that, <laughs> I'm always listening to something different. Well, I've been in a U2 mood lately. Nice. Uh, it was big than when I was a kid, uh, that Vegas ad they put out. Oh, yeah pretty gnarly so i've kind of gone back to my roots and i think tyler as a as a musician yourself this should be really easy right oh <laughs> i guess you might have to edit the beginning because um i'm not actually a musician but i like like a lot of people come into comic books from kind of the comic book world like scene and like being big followers of comic books but like when i was in college i was very closely following indie music and like attending oh. like lots of shows and stuff so that's kind of what i meant Okay, so if my life was like soundtracked, I think it would be like early Animal Collective, uh, where they were like a little more chaotic and and out there, like the from their 2005 album Feels. I think if if, if someone wants to get to know me, they can just listen to that. And I think and I'm actually gonna steal um, the the title from the last um, the last song on here. It's called Turn Into Something. I guess I, I, <laughs> I never knew what I like, what I really wanted to be actually, like, especially in my early twenties, like 
I wanted to be like a picture book artist, like a picture book writer and artist, like, like for ch- kids books. And then like, I also wanted to be like an indie musician, like in college. And then I ended up not ended up, you know, I pursued, you know, just graphic design and now comic book writing and some lettering. So it's like turning into something like just, just like becoming that version of me that has had a lot like preceding it. And I think that's cool advice for anyone listening that you don't know what you want to be at first. And um, then if you just like, just like pursue everything that you like, just like try everything and like you will kind of fall into something that clicks. Well, I do hate to say it, but that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you both so much for coming on the show. Oh, well, There's... We, we want to thank you for having us and giving us a chance, just like Scott Comics did, <laughs> because we're we're new on the scene and we want to you know, start collaborating with everyone. What do you think, Tommy? Uh, can I give a quick shout out to the colorist, Simon Oops. Robbins? He did the colors for number one. Uh, he's in Australia, just like Tom. I think they live in different parts of Australia. Uh, but he's a great colorist. And then, uh, unfortunately, he moved on to different projects. But we have Rebecca Good for issues two to six, and hopefully the rest of them. And she is, you know, as good as Simon. They're both amazing colorists. They put a lot of life into Tom's art. It's already got a lot of life to it. Yeah, shout out to the whole team and our editor, Colleen Douglas, Andre, who's been great for us. Um, Yeah, and we're just so excited for people to finally get to read Star Chaser, which is out like for real, for real on March 8th. And just seeing kind of following us if you think we're like cool or something. Before I let you both go, where can we find you? Where can we support you? Of course, how can we find this amazing comic online and any social medias you both want to promote? Yeah, I think below here, it says at Star Chaser Comic on Twitter, Insta is starchaser.comic. We also have the starlands.com, which kind of has everything. I'm at August Marches. I'm on Twitter at ETK Comics. I don't use it much, but I'm there. Everyone keeps saying I got to tweet more. So I'll put my thoughts on Oswald and comics. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT media. The podcast is back on twogeekstalking.podbean.com, but you can find it on any of your audio streaming services. Just search for Two Geeks Talking. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.